Working as an investigative journalist over the last decade, my work has pushed me to host a radio show, write books, and produce numerous documentaries about the realities of child trafficking, the dangers of technology, and indigenous struggles. Now, I aim to uncover whether there exists a network of individuals and institutions which ties these issues together. Many researchers posit the existence of an international cartel which covertly manipulates world events for their own benefit. Are these claims simply fantasy and paranoid delusion, or is there truly an agenda to manipulate humanity to the demands of the pyramid of power? Chapter 2. Establishment Media For many of us, one of the first things we do in the morning is check out our favorite news stations, newspapers, social media feeds, and websites to get informed on the important events of the day. People of all political persuasions have a desire to be informed about the world around them and the topics they care about. The average person might believe that the hundreds of TV stations, millions of websites, and never-ending social media feeds offer a limitless resource of factual, credible information that will keep them up to date about the important issues. However, as with the education system, there are many concerns related to mass media and the numerous conflicts of interests. First, let's start by looking at the history of media ownership in the United States and around the world. In the early 1980s, about 50 corporations controlled most of American media, including magazines, books, music, newspapers, movie studios, radio, and TV stations. Within a decade, that number would drop to around 25, and by the year 2000, just six corporations had control of about 90% of the media. As of 2020, that number is down to five corporations. These corporations include AT&T, Disney, Comcast, Fox Corps, and national amusements. Many of the previous large media corporations have been purchased by or merged with one of these top five. Comcast owns NBC, Telemundo, MSNBC, CNBC, USA Network, Sci-Fi, Oxygen, Bravo, the film studio Universal Pictures, multiple animation studios, and Universal Parks and Resorts. Disney owns Walt Disney Studios, which includes Pixar, Marvel Studios, Lucasfilm, and 20th Century Studios. Disney also owns ESPN and ABC News and Networks. Fox Corps owns Fox, Fox News Channel, Fox Business, Fox Sports, while National Amusements owns Viacom CBS, which owns Paramount Pictures, CBS Entertainment Network, Nickelodeon, BET, MTV, Comedy Central, and various international networks. AT&T is the world's largest media and entertainment company in terms of revenue. The mega corporation owns the Warner Media Group, which has film, TV, and cable assets, including Warner Brothers, HBO, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, TBS, TNT, and True TV. Internationally, large media conglomerates include Bertelsmann, National Amusements, Sony Corporation, Hearst Communications, MGM Holdings Incorporated, and Grupo Globo in South America. There are also major news organizations not owned by the Big Five. The New York Times is owned by the publicly held New York Times Corporation. The Washington Post is owned by Nash Holdings, an LLC owned by Amazon's Jeff Bezos. The Hearst family owned Hearst Publications, owns 24 newspapers, including the San Francisco Chronicle and Houston Chronicle, as well as magazines, TV stations, and cable and interactive media. Rupert Murdoch is the executive co-chairman of Fox Corporation and is also chairman of News Corps, which owns the Wall Street Journal and other publications. Altogether, his family controls 120 newspapers across five countries. Billionaire Michael Bloomberg is also a longtime media mogul with Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Media. Donald Newhouse and his brother Samuel Newhouse inherited Advanced Publications, a privately held media company that controls newspapers, magazine, cable TV, and entertainment assets including Discovery Channel, Reddit, and Condé Nast, which publishes magazines Wired, Vandy Fair, GQ, The New Yorker, and Vogue. Several other billionaires, including Comcast CEO Brian Roberts and Liberty Media Chairman John Malone, own or control cable TV networks that are powerful but not primarily news-focused. One clear example of how funding by billionaires and megacorporations can create a conflict of interest 
came in 2016 when the New York Times published an article criticizing the power that billionaires wield over media companies. One ultra wealthy media investor was not mentioned in the story, Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim. At the time, Slim owned the largest individual stake at the Times, but was not mentioned. Slim sold half of his stocks in 2017, but still remains the second largest shareholder. While there is no clear evidence that Slim played any role in the omission of his ownership of the Times, it does illustrate the difficulty the average reader faces in assessing who is trying to influence their worldview. It's clear that the consolidation of the media presents an opportunity for the corporations, shareholders, families, and individuals behind the media to influence and shape public opinion. This is one of the reasons the media has often been called the fourth estate, a phrase derived from the traditional European concept of the three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the common people. The fourth estate represents a fourth power in press and news media which have the capacity to advocate for and frame political issues. In the 1988 book Manufacturing Consent, noted intellectual and linguist Noam Chomsky and Edward S. Herman argue that the mass media of the U.S. are effective and powerful institutions which use system-supportive propaganda to influence the public without the use of coercion. They call this the propaganda model of communication. For many people, the idea that propaganda is used by democratic rather than merely authoritarian governments will be a strange one. Well, uh, the term propaganda fell into disfavor at the t uh, around the Second World War, but in the 1920s and the 1930s, it was commonly used and, in fact, advocated uh, not by leading intellectuals, by the founders of modern political science, by uh, Wilsonian progressives, and, of course, by the public relations industry as a necessary technique uh, to overcome the danger of democracy. The institutional structure of the media is quite straightforward. We're talking about the United States, but it's not very different elsewhere. The, uh, the major, there, there are sectors, but the agenda-setting media, the ones that sort of set the framework for everyone else, like the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on, uh, these are major corporations, parts of even bigger conglomerates, like other in corporate institutions, they have a product with, and a market. Uh, their market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. Their product is privileged, relatively privileged audiences, more or so less. They're, they're selling audiences to They're other selling privileged audiences. These are big, business, big corporations selling privileged audiences to other corporations. Now the question is, what, would a ra what picture of the world would a rational person expect to come out of this structure? And then we draw some conclusions about what you'd expect, and then we check, and yes, that's the picture of the world that comes out. In the 2002 introduction to the book, they write, quote, The media serve and propagandize on behalf of the powerful societal interests that control and finance them. The representatives of these interests have important agendas and principles that they want to advance, and they are well positioned to shape and constrain media policy. Chomsky has gone on to describe various methods the media uses to influence public opinion, including by distraction, gradualism, deferring actions until a later date that the public might be more accepting, talking to the public like children, stirring up viewers' emotions, keeping the public ignorant, promoting trends, blaming the public for problems, and by understanding the underlying psychology of the masses. Ben Bagdikian, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, describes the five media giants as a cartel that wields enough influence to change U.S. politics and define social values. Quote, The Ford Motor Company and General Motors do not compete to the death because each has too much to lose in an all-or-nothing rivalry. Similarly, the major media maintains their cartel-like relationships with only marginal differences among them, a relationship that leaves all of them alive and well, but leaves the majority of Americans with artificially narrowed choices in their media. Ruling Class Journalism as early as 1973, reports started to reveal that the U.S. intelligence community was infiltrating foreign and domestic media. In late November of that year, the New York Times reported that the CIA had about three dozen American journalists working abroad on its payroll as undercover informants, some of them as full-time agents. None of the names of the journalists were revealed to the public. In 1975, the U.S. Senate organized the U.S. Senate Select Committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities, otherwise known as the Church Committee, named after Idaho Senator Frank Church, who chaired the committee. Church and his team were tasked with investigating abuses by the CIA, the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and the Internal Revenue Service. 
The church committee investigations are well known for revealing many illegal activities by the intelligence community, including the discovery of Operation Shamrock, in which the major telecommunications companies shared their traffic with the NSA from 1945 to the early 1970s. There was also discussion about a poison dart program that could cause someone to have a heart attack. And of course, there were the infamous MKUltra documents, which revealed the CIA's efforts to manipulate and control the human mind. The Church Committee's final report, published in April 1976, also covered CIA ties with both foreign and domestic news media. The report mentions that agents had planted false stories about activists, including Martin Luther King Jr. The report found that the CIA maintained a network of several hundred foreign individuals around the world who provide intelligence for the CIA and at times attempted to influence public opinion through the use of covert propaganda. These individuals provided the CIA with direct access to many newspapers and periodicals, press services and news agencies, radio and TV stations, commercial book publishers, and other foreign media outlets. In the United States, the CIA estimated they had around 50 assets who are individual American journalists or employees of U.S. media organizations. The committee found that more than a dozen U.S. news organizations and commercial publishing houses formally provided cover for the CIA agents abroad. At a House Intelligence Committee hearing in 1975, CIA Director William Colby was questioned about whether the agency had employees in TV networks and newspapers. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. In 1976, a New York Times article titled CIA Ties to Journalists reported that, quote, a draft copy of a report by the House Select Committee on Intelligence last week said that 11 full-time officers of the CIA were posing as journalists overseas in connection with their intelligence work. The report said further that until 1978, live agents had posed as full-time correspondents with organizations that have major general news impact. Moreover, the report said some 15 news organizations had cooperated with the CIA in providing cover for CIA operatives. The Times goes on to state that press freedom here is protected from government intrusion under the First Amendment to the Constitution, and thus a reader, viewer, or listener has the right to expect that the news will not be slanted to conform to a governmental position. An agent reporting from abroad to the United States would face an impossible task in sorting out his allegiance to his real employer, the CIA, from that to his news organization and its readers. The CIA formally refused to make public the names of which American news agencies cooperated with the CIA which ones allowed themselves to be used as cover, and the names of the reporters who secretly worked for the CIA. The Times also noted that Sam Jaff, a former TV reporter who admitted to working with the FBI, accused popular journalists like Walter Cronkite of CBS of being on the list of journalists paid by the CIA. Despite the fact that the US government never actually used the name, the CIA's manipulation of mainstream media has come to be known as Operation Mockingbird. First of all, it is important to note that what we know of as Operation Mockingbird was not called Operation Mockingbird, or at least there is absolutely no reason to believe that. The entire uh, idea that this program to infiltrate the media was called Operation Mockingbird actually sources to a single offhand mention in one book by Deborah Davis about Catherine Graham that was sourced to an unnamed anonymous CIA person, so take it for what it's worth. Having said that, the CIA absolutely did engage, and presumably still does, but admittedly did engage in an extensive operation to infiltrate the media at all levels, less controversially internationally, by setting up publishing houses, by having journalists and, and, uh, and reporters stationed overseas, by uh, various methods for controlling what was seen overseas, but that, at least theoretically, is, with, is within the CIA's mandate to operate internationally. More controversially, it absolutely did the same things domestically within the United States, directly against the CIA's charter to operate only internationally. And we do not have to go on a speculative limb for that. It was admitted during the church committee hearings by the CIA that they did have agents in 
the American media that would, uh, at the very least, forward stories to American media uh, for publication. But subsequent reporting on that by Carl Bernstein in his seminal 1977 work for Rolling Stones, The CIA and the Media, he absolutely showed uh, from a number of different sources that there were not only journalists who were reporting and in acting essentially as informants for the CIA, there were actual agents that were undercover as journalists and reporters. The CIA had extensive ties to editors and extensive ties to publishers like the family behind the New York Times. And uh, other reporting has shown that, for example, Alan Dulles in the early days of the CIA could and did often call up publishers in the U.S. in order to uh, change certain stories or to get certain things facts reported or not reported. Carl Bernstein's 1977 Rolling Stone article, The CIA and the Media, reported that the relationship between the intelligence community and the mainstream media was much more extensive than even the church committee revealed. The CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. Bernstein alleged that the committee actually helped cover up some of the worst aspects of the partnership because it would have revealed, quote, embarrassing relationships in the 1950s and 1960s with some of the most powerful organizations and individuals in American journalism. Bernstein reported that from 1950 to 1966, about 10 CIA employees were provided cover by the New York Times under arrangements approved by the newspaper's late publisher, Arthur Hayes Sulzberger. The cover arrangements were part of a general Times policy to provide assistance to the CIA whenever possible. In addition, Sulzberger was a close friend of CIA director Alan Dulles. Bernstein's reporting also showed that during the 1950s, the CIA conducted a formal training program to instruct its agents to function as newsmen. Quote, these were the guys who went through the ranks and were told, you're going to be a journalist, one CIA official told Bernstein. Bernstein also reported that the CIA's former director, Alan Dulles, and close friend Henry Luce, the founder of Time and Life magazine, regularly allowed members of his staff to work for the CIA. Several other revelations came out in 1977, including Sig Mikkelsen, former head of CBS, admitting that he had often worked with the intelligence community in the 1950s. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, the ships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. Additionally, the Times reported that, quote, Dozens of English and foreign language publications around the world have been owned, subsidized, or influenced in some way by the CIA over the past three decades as part of a global propaganda network maintained by the agency. Perhaps even more damaging, William Colby admitted that some American networks had unwittingly repeated false stories planted by the CIA. The CIA claimed the practice of using journalists to distribute stories had ended in 1973. However, in July 1996, the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence held a hearing regarding public policy on the CIA's possible use of journalists, clergy, or Peace Corps. The director of the CIA at the time, John Deutsch, wanted to change regulations prohibiting the use of journalists, clergy, and missionaries, and the Peace Corps abroad to perform political intelligence operations. A New York Times article from February 1996 notes that Deutsch was questioned about reports that the CIA had secretly waived 1977 regulations in extraordinarily rare occasions and used journalistic or media cover for intelligence activities overseas. CIA officials declined to acknowledge whether members of church leadership have been used as CIA assets as well. Interestingly, the Times article notes that the controversy over the CIA's use of non-diplomatic covers came after recommendations by a task force sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations. The task force called for ending legal and policy restraints that limit the CIA's use of such non-diplomatic covers as journalists and members of clergy. The reason this connection is interesting is because only three years earlier, in 1993, Richard Harwood, journalist and former editor of the Washington Post, wrote a powerful article titled Ruling Class Journalists in which he outlines how the American corporate mainstream media serves the agenda of the ruling class. Harwood doesn't focus his column on the US intelligence agencies which are using the media to spread various types of propaganda. Instead, Harwood discusses the connection between the American media and the Council on Foreign Relations. Harwood writes, quote, In its 70-year history, the quarterly journal Foreign Affairs has had but five editors. The fifth, recently appointed, is James Hogue, former publisher of the New York Daily News, and before that, editor of the Chicago Sun-Times. 
The Quarterly is published by the Council on Foreign Relations, whose members are the nearest thing we have to a ruling establishment in the United States. The President is a member, so is his Secretary of State, the Deputy Secretary of State, all five of the Undersecretaries, several of the Assistant Secretaries, and the Department's Legal Advisor, the President's National Security Advisor, and his Deputy are members. The Director of Central Intelligence, like all previous Directors, and the Chairman of the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board are members. Harvard goes on to note that many leading figures of American political life were members of the Council on Foreign Relations, including Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Henry Kissinger, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Cyrus Vance, McGeorge Bundy, Governor Mario Cuomo, and so on. In later chapters of this series, we will return to the topic of the Council on Foreign Relations and how non-governmental organizations, think tanks, and nonprofits also play a role in the pyramid of power. The point is that the media around the world are not only influenced by corporate dollars and interests, but they are often a tool for disseminating intelligence community propaganda and promoting the agenda of the ruling class. Despite the promises of ending collaboration between spy agencies and journalists, as recently as 2014, the CIA was caught collaborating with the journalists from the LA Times. The Rise of Independent Media Due to the consistent failures of the corporate media and the glaring bias, the public has developed a thirst for unfiltered, honest reporting that is not often found on TV and radio networks. The internet helped accelerate the rise of an independent or alternative media where citizen journalists, activists, self-taught reporters, and social media commentators compete directly with the corporate media. The internet also saw the launch of hundreds of thousands of new websites that do not fit into the traditional media hierarchy. In the mid-2000s, with the emergence of YouTube and other popular social media networks, the alternative media was able to outpace the mainstream media and reach the masses at an unprecedented rate. By the 2010s, a growing ecosystem of alternative media websites, channels, podcasts, and reporters began to materialize. Some outlets eschewed the glitz and glamour of the corporate media in favor of reports broadcast in living rooms and from the streets. Other outlets aimed to recreate the professionalism of the mainstream while retaining a willingness to question all angles. Unfortunately, the decentralized nature of the internet has been forsaken in favor of centralized institutions which offer search engines, social media, and other internet services. The vast majority of the public use Google, Facebook, and YouTube to learn about the world around them. These folks mistakenly assume that they are seeing everything that is available on the internet. As we will detail in our upcoming chapter on big tech, this is far from true. After the 2016 US presidential election, many independent outlets and journalists from across the political spectrum faced another attack in the form of the fake news media. You are fake news. First popularized by Donald Trump, the fake news label was quickly used to attack any outlets that did not parrot the mainstream version of events surrounding the 2016 election. One by one, independent media websites and pages were labeled fake, fake news or Russian disinformation and subsequently deleted from various social media platforms. Since that time, the social media landscape has shifted even further with the use of corporate fact checkers and banning of certain topics altogether. Another way the pyramid of power maintains influence is through purchasing and or funding of so-called new media companies which attempt to portray themselves as independent and are typically marketed towards a younger audience. Despite the slick presentation and the use of a younger, diverse crowd as reporters, these companies are merely a rebranding of the same propaganda distributed by the billionaires, corporations, and intelligence agencies. Some of these companies include Vice Media, Vox Media, and BuzzFeed. The intelligence agency's attempt to manipulate and influence public opinion goes beyond hiring journalists. According to one of the documents leaked by Edward Snowden, the British government maintains software for online persona management. The British government communications headquarters, the GCHQ, operates an elite unit known as the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group, or JTRIG. The documents outline tactics employed by the agency, including ways to manipulate public opinion, understand human thinking and behavior, and encourage conformity. One of the reports from 2011 outlines JTRIG's tactics, including uploading YouTube videos containing persuasive communications, starting Facebook groups and Twitter accounts, and creating fake online personalities and supporters to discredit, promote distrust, dissuade, deter, delay, or disrupt. The unit uses social media campaigns to encourage and foster obedience and conformity. Both the British intelligence and the US intelligence community desire to promote obedience and conformity within the public. They aim to keep the public propagandized, distracted, misinformed, and fighting amongst ourselves. The billionaires use their media outlets and their friends in government to keep the public blissfully unaware of their efforts to gain power and wealth. Thankfully, there are solutions. 
Even with the censorship and outright deleting of alternative media journalists and outlets, there are some solutions available. For starters, more and more mainstream journalists are opting to leave behind the corporate world and join the independent media in the interest of reporting factual, investigative journalism. The last decade has seen Amber Lyon leave CNN, Cheryl Atkinson leave CBS, Glenn Greenwald leave The Guardian for The Intercept, and then leave The Intercept to go completely independent. Another mainstream journalist turned independent reporter is Ben Swan, a former anchor for CBS Atlanta who left after facing censorship for his reporting. I recently spoke with Ben Swan about what he sees as the failures of the mainstream media, including the idea that journalists cannot have opinions. Well, the idea that journalists don't have opinions is, is absolutely false, right? And that's obvious. It's obvious. Human nature says every human is going to have opinions on things. Actually, this is a, a kind of a misleading concept that's been pushed by, by companies like CNN for a long time. It's, it's what Glenn Greenwald calls the view to nowhere, right? Which is, I'm the subjective journalist. I don't have an opinion. I don't know anything. I just report what I see. But that's, not, that's a robot. Right? That's not a person. Um, and so what is a more honest way of handling it is to say, you know what? I do have an opinion. And if I'm upfront about my opinions, so obviously I'm very libertarian in my views, I believe in individual freedom, individual liberties, I'm very upfront about that so you know where I'm coming from. However, it, it's not important whether or not you have an opinion. It's important whether or not you take the facts of a story and you twist them to meet your opinion, or you twist them to fit what you already have as, as a preconceived notion. I believe that as journalists, that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is saying, we'll, we'll go wherever the facts lead us in a story, but obviously we're gonna have opinions on things. Swan and other former mainstream journalists have not only abandoned traditional media outlets, Many have begun using alternative social media platforms and websites to broadcast their video reports and articles. Glenn Greenwald and journalist Matt Taibbi have begun using independent service Substack to publish their reports, while Swan has launched his own video service, Ice.media, to report freely without being censored by social media companies and search engines. Pushback against the social purge taking place on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Additionally, there are a number of alternative social media sites and video hosting platforms that have begun to offer a censorship-free experience for those who desire an unfiltered social media and news platform. Sites like BitChute, Library, Minds, Float, and Hive offer content creators options for overcoming the mainstream media dominance. As consumers of the media, we have the opportunity to support websites and platforms that provide fair coverage of important events. As Ben Swan noted, this doesn't mean news media that has no opinion or bias. Rather, it's the expectation that the media will trust the viewer to consume content from a wide range of opinions and views and make up their own mind. The answer is for each of us to make a conscious decision to unplug from state-run propaganda networks and online platforms that attempt to make up your mind for you. The answer is to support independent media organizations and journalists who do the vital work of dissecting the world around us and presenting the facts to the public. Only by consciously choosing to support true independent media that is not funded by billionaires, corporations, and spy agencies can we possibly hope to preserve a free media that will empower and educate the public. To learn more about the control and manipulation of the media, we recommend reading Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing of Consent and Ben Bakdikian's The New Media Monopoly.